infinite complacency. People went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. What if monsters and entities really do exist? What if all the encounters reported on podcasts like Into the Fray are true? What happens when they creep into our world from other dimensions? Who would stop them? Who could? Project Threshold. Harris Berger, Jax, Billy, Jesse, and their new recruit Pendlehaven go head-to-head with an unknown advanced civilization, hunt something loose on the streets of Chicago, killing homeless people, cope with the aftermath of witnessing awful things, battle underwater monsters in the Midwest, and investigate an apartment building where people regularly commit suicide. Created by Craig Crawford, the first novella, Project Threshold, Team Burger, is available now at Amazon, Apple Books, and Barnes & Noble. Another novella will release each month for the rest of the year. You can discover more at projectthreshold.com or by going to Amazon and searching Project Threshold, Team Burger. That's B-E-R-G-E-R. So on this edition of Into the Fray, I welcome back on with me, author John Olson. Uh, John, you have been on several, several times. Your latest released, Stranger World, is book seven in the Stranger Bridgerland book series. And this book has stories from all over the world, which is not surprising to me because of the fact that people know about you. They want to reach out to you. They want to share their encounters and stories with you. And I saw that this book has already hit number one in a couple of categories on Amazon. So congratulations. Oh, thank you so much, Shannon. Yeah, it was it was awesome. It did, you know, it reached that number one on a couple of spots for uh, the new releases. And I was just kind of blown away. Uh, it's It's been really great. Some, you know, great reviews and talking with people and been doing this now for eight years the writing part so it just every year it amazes me how receptive people are and and just how fun it is to do this so it is and you never know when you open your email or facebook or wherever you happen to get all of these correspondences right who you're going to hear from so that's pretty exciting yeah, it really is. And, you know, it, it especially the last few years where I've been collecting stories from, like you say, around the world, it's so fun to open up and you're like, oh my gosh, that's somebody from Australia or somebody from England. Or it, it's very, it's very exciting to be all over the world now and, and talking to people and, and getting out there. And it's, it's amazing. This is, again, I'm just very blessed because, you know, the book, the books have done so well. And Annie and I have been able to keep doing this and, and to meet, you know, wonderful people like you and and a lot of people in the paranormal world. It's, it's been a real blessing. Yeah. And like usual, I got sent the book and I'm looking through and I'm going, there's so many good ones. I didn't know which to choose. And these Mm -hmm. like, like your other books, they really do run the gamut. You've got cryptids, you've got hauntings, you've got the one-off head scratchers, which I always, always love those. Uh, I mean, are there, are there some that I'm, I guess I'm probably asking a question that I usually ask at the end, but I would imagine then that, I mean, another book coming, book number eight, uh, to, to total nine years total of writing for, for, for you, because of the fact that these do run the gamut. And then I'm wondering, like, I wonder how many more, John's got in the hopper for book eight, book nine, book 10. 
I, yeah, I've actually already started um, on the next one, on book eight. And um, Annie and I have been talking about it for a while. Annie's, for those of you who don't know, my wife and also works with me. She's my editor and um, all of that. And we're, we decided that, you know, we've gotten a lot of stories. We're still collecting stories from all over, but we're going to kind of centralize it now. So my next book that I'm working on is going to be Stranger Utah. And so it'll focus on, you know, a lot of the stories that I have from here in Utah, the new ones. And then we'll kind of go from there. Uh, you can talk about, you know, which state um, I have the most story from, stories from there and kind of focus on that and, and reach out and get more stories from that state. And, and then just keep going from there and maybe in there too, do another Stranger World 2 or something. Because like I said, I'm still getting stories from all over the world. But uh, yep, already working on book eight stranger utah so we'll keep plugging away i'll keep writing as long as i keep getting stories i it's it's fun to do and it's like i said it's just amazing to meet people you know we meet people like you and then you know get to meet people who email us or you know set up interviews and so yeah i'll just keep going as long as i keep getting stories well as as you know and and at least some people that are listening know Utah definitely has my heart as be as far as being strange because of the fact that that's where I had my first encounter and what really got me fired up about I know for a fact like many of you that there are a lot of things uh, in the other category that we run into sometimes so I'm excited to hear about that book well John we're going to jump right in here and we are going to talk about a chapter that you titled Not My Mother and this is Amy from Connecticut. Yes. You know, Amy emailed me and contacted me and I was able to get this story, which is, I, you know, it's a great story. And it's one of those two. I, I kind of, like you said, kind of a head scratcher makes you think, you know, what possibly could have been going on at the time. She's telling us the story, telling me the story. She was about nine years old. She, it was uh, the week before Halloween and, you know, they'd been doing ghost stories at school and, you know, kind of that fall spooky season, she remembers. She came home, you know, walked home from school, lived in this part, you know, a part where she didn't live far from school. It was just the almost kind of wonderful suburban Connecticut kind of place with the beautiful foliage. She gets home and has, you know, basically a normal everyday evening, having dinner with the family, watching some TV doing her homework and then getting ready for bed. And, you know, she goes to bed, nothing out of the ordinary. She woke up in the middle of the night. She didn't know what time it was, but she had to use the facility. She, you know, had too much to drink and needed to go to the restroom. And there was a uh, one bathroom it was connected to her parents' bedroom. And so she didn't want to go there and wake them up. So she walked all the way through the house and you have to walk through the front room and over to the um, spare bathroom. And as she walked in, she realized somebody's sitting on the couch, kind of in the dark. And she realizes it's her mother sitting there. She just kind of, first, she's a little bit of in shock that somebody was sitting there, but she really needed to use the bathroom. So she runs, uses the bathroom, comes out. Her mom's still sitting there. She said her mom was in her clothes. She had her hair was kind of messed up and she was just basically staring off into space. She, you know, asked her mom, mom, are you okay? Her mom turns to look at her. She just has this horrible, mean and disgusted look on her face. And she's just staring at her, you know, her mom and her mom's staring at her in, in just disgust. And she's like, mom, what's wrong? And her mom gets up just with this, the whole vibe of anger and mean and just and she walks around to the kitchen because the kitchen was joining the front room and so you it was open space so you kind of see right into the kitchen and everything and her mom walks to the kitchen and then gives her like a disgusted look again just mean disgusted look slams the door open and walks to the backyard and disappears being nine years old and having this experience and she's just distraught so later on she you know she was thinking at the time is you know is mom sleepwalking what's going on because her mom she talked about how nice her mom is like the nicest person in the world and this was totally out of character so she runs to her parents bedroom to wake up her dad she runs in and and, and yells to dad 
and he turns on the light and when he does he realizes that mom is in bed with dad they're both in there and they kind of wake up groggy and looking at her and like what's going on she just kind of breaks down obviously because of this experience um her mom that wasn't her mother her mother's in bed and what's going on and so she breaks down and jumps into bed and tells him what happened. And her dad gets up and runs out. And he just finds the kitchen, the back kitchen door wide open, looks around and can't find anybody and and comes back. And they're just trying to console her. But she's obviously very confused, very upset. She talked about, like, for the rest of, you know, growing up in that house, she refused to get up at night, which I don't blame her one bit. And she slept in her parents' room for a week, I believe, a week or two after. You know, as she got older and trying to figure this out and, you know, had heard some of my stories and contacted me, I, I tried to explain to her this doppelganger thing that happens sometimes to people where th these entities or whatever they are will mimic family members or friends or even yourself. Or there's also... The glitches in the matrix where sometimes maybe you're seeing somebody from another dimension but it was definitely one that was out there it's different than you know a lot of stuff that you hear about but yeah it was really it's kind of a cool creepy really weird story yeah anytime for the most part that you're talking about a doppelganger or a mimic situation it's usually not not good. I've not heard very many encounters where people go, oh, I saw, like you said, I, I either saw myself or I saw my, my brother or whoever, and it was really cool and I enjoyed it. I don't recall ever hearing a positive experience. No, and as I've done more research on it, you know, there's stories going back, like way back into like the 1800s and stuff where people have seen doppelgangers like this. And there's a stigma to it that it is a sign of really bad luck to see one. And especially if you see one of yourself is supposed to be like the ultimate bad, <laughs> bad luck thing. So it's, it's something that's gone on for, you know, a long, long time, you know, and maybe it's a plethora of things where sometimes it's something mimicking somebody, or sometimes it's a view through to another dimension, or maybe, you know, you have no idea, but yeah, definitely. Uh, strange and and like you mentioned it's never a good thing it oftentimes um, when I've interviewed people who've who have had experiences like this with doppelgangers or something like that they're always really angry and really have this really bad feel about them so yeah very interesting also the fact that this particular this particular one it was disheveled you know the 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 mm -hmm. quote unquote mother's hair was messed up and she just seemed ticked off. Uh, like the, like Amy was saying, she just seemed disgusted with me, which that would be terrifying if you're not used to your mom ever acting that way. And, and just knowing then that, Oh, there's mom laying in bed asleep. That was not my mother. So perfect title for that one. And unfortunately though, as mentioned before, especially if something happens if something happens in the woods that's really, really bad, you just don't go in the woods again. But if it's your own home, I mean, look at what it did to Amy. She It completely changed her routine. And then even if she had to really, really go to the bathroom, she's like, I'm holding it. I don't care. Yep, exactly. And, you know, when you're, when you're nine, when you're around that age, nine, ten years old, the things like that, you know, normal... Well, I don't want to call them normal. Normal bad things will scare you, let alone abnormal bad things can really, you know, scar you at that age. So it, it does make it really, really hard on, on people, especially kids. And then uh, do you recall if Amy mentioned anything happening after this at all in the home? No, no, nothing, nothing else happened. Nothing before, nothing after. It was just a really kind of a one-off thing that really stuck with her, so telling you those one-offs those are some of my favorites because it's just it's it's just as strange that it was a one-off than if it was this, the, the beginning of of a whole plethora of goings on right exactly and i've and i've interviewed people which is interesting you mentioned that because um sometimes they'll go you go most of your life some people and never have an experience and then they'll have one and it almost seems to swing the door open for right. other experiences so yeah and it's just as weird that this didn't. And that happens a lot too. 
Yeah. Yep. All right. So next we are going yeah. with My Brother's Duende. And this is from southeastern Mexico. And right off the bat, should we explain what is a duende or should we wait until we tell the story or you share this with us? You know, I'm going to share the story first and then I'll get into a little bit of the the history and, and where it comes from and, and the folklore, because I, I think it's it's kind of interesting the way it all kind of plays together. Absolutely. So. So, yeah, so I actually was contacted by uh, Sophia, and it was her mother who had had the experience. And her mother still doesn't speak English. So Sophia was kind of my go-between and and translator in, in getting this story. And I was really glad that they shared it with me because, you know, it took a little bit. She had shared the story with Sophia, and then Sophia had heard me somewhere and wanted to share it and took a little talking, you know, to let her mom share i i changed their names because of this and everything even though they really wouldn't didn't even give me the name of the little town in mexico or anything but it was it was really fascinating to me because uh, these i guess fey kind of things creatures are probably some of the more rare stories i get for some reason um i guess because i guess it's just really rare for that to happen but um i was kind of excited when i got this she through her her daughter was explaining she grew up in a small town like you said in southeastern Mexico and she grew up in the 50s she was it was around the 50s when this happened really kind of a rural not a lot of money part of of Mexico and she had two older brothers and a younger brother but this dealt with her older brother that was just a year older than her and at the time she was around 8 he was around 9 and they were going to school together but they had a like they fought all the time they uh, they fought at home they fought outside and it had a lot to do with their personalities and the fact they were so close in age one day they they go to school they had to walk to school and while they were at school they had a they got caught fighting the two of them and the teacher made them stay after school to to clean up a little bit kind of a punishment try and get them to stop fighting and when they finished, they were walking home, and it was, so it was later afternoon. Diego was trying to talk to her. She's just, Rosa's got nothing to do with him. She didn't want anything. She was just fuming that he had, she had to stay after school, and she was mad at him. So he runs off ahead and, and takes off. And the road to their little house out there, kind of the little farm area they lived, is just a winding dirt road. So after her brother ran off and, and is gone, she's walking home. and. All of a sudden, out of the brush uh, comes this little dirt clod, and it hits her, and she, uh, like, instantly she's mad because she's convinced, you know, Diego is hiding in the brush, throwing things at her. And so she yells at him to leave him, leave her alone, and she starts walking back home, and then she gets hit with a rock in the leg. She's like... <laughs> she's at this point she's ready to fight she's like all right let's 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 do this she's mad she throws her books down there's a little ditch and then some brush so she she jumps the ditch and runs through the brush expecting to find diego in there as she runs through this brush it comes to an opening it's not diego that's in the opening just across the opening from her not far is this little man standing about three feet tall uh he had brushy just matted black hair and a brushy black beard with gray streaks in it. Um, the funny thing is she says she was so full of adrenaline and stuff when she ran in it, it, everything kind of just seared into her memory. It's been a long time and she still can see this little man and he had black eyes and just yellow teeth bared back like a dog. She stopped in shock, obviously and this little guy's just kind of staring at her and and kind of growling. And then he, you know, in Spanish, he tells her, you leave Diego alone. He's my person and I watch out for him. And, and then he just runs off. And so she, she finally comes to her senses, runs all the way home, crying, obviously. Yeah, finds her mom, just bawling. Her mom picks her up, takes her in, brushes her off and, and when she finally comes down to explain to her mom what had happened to her, her mom explains to her what a duende is, which in 
you know, South America, and then actually, um, I believe also in the Philippines, they have the, the very, it might even be the same name, these little creatures, little people that live near the homes, they they take, you know, they take care of the people, and sometimes they do things, they're kind of mischievous, but they will at times attach themselves to one person that they really like, and kind of take care of that person. And so she's telling her that that Duende has probably attached himself to Diego and he's very upset that you guys are fighting. And so her mom calms her down that night. Her mom and dad make them sit down her and Diego and say, you know, this is what happened. This is, you know, it's very serious. You guys have got to stop fighting. And so, you know, they, they kind of, hug it out and promise they're not going to fight anymore. And then for the next couple of weeks, her mom helps her make cookies and milk to leave out near the old barn part, the, the old, the, the corrals in the barn for the Duende. And she even writes him a note saying, I'm sorry, Die you know, Diego and I are not going to fight anymore, you know, and she never sees this thing again. Um, the cookies were always gone, she said, but it's really kind of fascinating the story because um, you go through and read the history, and that's what it is. The little Duende, um, they talk about, you know, they live on the farms or around there. Some, you know, they claim sometimes they live in the walls and take care of people, and they can be mischievous. And it's, uh, especially in kind of the rural parts of Mexico, it's it's a deep-seated thing. And she she was very forthcoming about, you know, what she saw, and she knows she saw it. And I just, I just really kind of love that story. Yeah, I did too. And as you say in the very beginning, it is quite fae like right? Like you have to eventually, uh, as soon as you know what's going on, you kind of have to placate them with treats or gifts or apologize in some way, shape, or form to at least tamper down some of the, the negative effects of them being around. Yeah, you really do. And, you know, as I've, as, as I've studied these and I've you know, interviewed people, and gotten these, you know, a few of these stories, I went through because I wanted to know the history and everything like that. And one thing that always amazes me, and I try and tell people this, especially people that scoff at it, because it's an easy one for people to scoff at. But I'm like, you know, you wouldn't believe the number of people like you had all these people around the world at one point, um, the Native Americans here, you had people in Northern Europe, in Africa, and in Asia that all ran into this exact same kind of creatures, all of these exact same kind of creatures, they gave them different names, but they all seem to be, do the same thing and have the same backstory. And you can't have that with separated people from all over the world back then and not understand that there's something paranormal going on there. There's a reason that there's the same creatures or same, you know, Faye all over the world, but with different names that do the same thing. That's just fascinating to me. And John, to be honest with you, anytime a new book of yours comes out, I'm kind of always going, okay, where's the little quote unquote person story in this book? Because, <laughs> and I'm sure that you've heard me bring it up and I know everyone listening has, but one of my all time favorites that you have ever shared and collected was the little dude that came into the campsite. And the only reason the guy knew was because the, you know, the book that the little dude was holding had been next to the, the man's head while he was, you know, he fell asleep reading a book, the book flops down on the ground next to him. And then he sees little dude reading that very same book, which means that he had come right next to his head and grabbed the book. And he's just chilling on a log reading this poor guy's book while he's alone, mind you, in Again, here we go, middle of the woods, where you don't want to be when something bad happens and you're alone. Yeah. And, and you know, when I wrote that story, and when I got that story and wrote it, and I really thought of it as a one-off thing, because it's just so kind of, it's out there and very strange. It's a small creature in the woods and everything. And uh, since I since I published that story from that guy, I have found three other stories that I'm actually trying to get from the direct person. Cause like, you know, I, I like to have it first person, but I've had three different people come to me that said, Oh my gosh, my husband ran into that thing up there. And I thought he was crazy that I thought he was lying to me until I read your book. 
And then it was exactly like he kind of explained it. And it's been three different people in that same area who've had a run in with that, that kind of that, that creature up there. So to me, that's, that's like, it reiterates, you know, that this guy's story, it validates his story and it validates the whole thing. And yeah, that one was definitely one of the creepier ones that I've, that I've gotten. Yeah, it's one of my all time favorites. And it just come it constantly will come up, even if I'm on somebody else's show. I'll bring that one up. Uh, but that is really incredible to hear that there's actually some leads to other people that might have seen it. That is so cool. Yeah, there is. And I'm I'm trying to hunt those down because I want I, I you're like me. When you hear something like that, you just gotta hunt it down because you're like, that's such a great story. I've got to find that person. So I've I've got a I've always got a stack a metaphorical stack of stories where I'm hunting down the people because it's just amazing stories. So that's definitely some of them. Well, this next one, uh, (laughs) this one stuck with me because of the fact that I do have some things from my childhood. Like I have my boggling, one of my boggling still, or my uh, popple uh, somewhere in in boxes. You know, um, if you guys out there have one of these, specific ernie dolls you may want to pay attention to this next story out of british columbia yes so um it's called evil ernie which i thought was very apt for this story i got contacted by uh, adam he was telling the story of in the late 90s um, him and his wife had gotten married um they were expecting a uh, First, they were expecting a baby, and he lost his job. She couldn't work. She was sick, so they'd moved in with his his mom, I believe is who it was, or her mom. Finally, after the baby came and he got a job, and uh, she was able to find a part-time job, they were excited to get out of that house and finally have an apartment. So it's in uh, around Vancouver, British Columbia, around uh, 1990, 98, late 90s. They moved into this apartment, and... First, there there really wasn't much. He, they didn't notice much when they moved in. But then slowly things started going kind of weird. The first thing he noticed is he always had a, like a little bowl by the door or a little place where he put his keys. Um, so he knew where they were when he'd get up early to go to work. And the keys started moving. They weren't there. They were somewhere weird. Um, he'd find them in the bathroom in the morning. Finally, one time he happened to look up and saw them, you know, in the light. It was kind of a fishbowl light above in the kitchen, like somebody had thrown them in there. And at first he thought it was his wife playing tricks on him. And she was, you know, no, that not me. Then uh, his wife started talking about weird bangs going on in the apartment and just weird things. And at first, you know, they thought, well, it's just kind of new place, weird sounds. You're getting used to it. His mother had bought the baby this little Ernie doll. And for those of you that don't know, you can look it up. It was called Sleepy Time Ernie. And he would talk and snore and sleep. At first, the first night that something went weird was he woke up to the sound of Sleepy Time Ernie talking and snoring. And he got up expecting to find it in with the baby, but it was actually in the hallway. So he picked it up and he turned it off and put it in in the baby's room and then it just slowly started progressing to where you know every night they would find it in the hallway in the middle of the night waking them up making sounds talking and so he took the batteries out of it and put it in there after a while you know he after he taken the batteries out the next night he hears sleepy time ernie in there snoring and talking and he gets up and he's kind of cussing his wife under his breath because he's like she's put the batteries back in i told her not to it's in the hallway he goes to pick it up and as he picks it up it stops talking and he flips it over and there's no batteries in it and he's like what the crap so he puts it in the room and and then i you know for several nights that happens again where it it's snoring and talking and doesn't have batteries in it one night he finally takes it and throws it in the garbage when he got home from work i believe um his wife you know made him get it and clean it up because it's their daughter's favorite toy is a little you know, a little baby but you know he's really kind of upset because 
this thing keeps talking without the batteries and when you go to pick it up it stops then one night everything finally comes to a head it's around two o'clock in the morning and he wakes up to his wife punching him in the arm you know and he let, he sits up groggily wondering what's going on and in the doorway the door of their bedroom is open and there's this huge hulking figure of a man standing in their doorway and he's got a huge greasy beard black hair he's got an uh, uh, ripped up pants and an old flannel shirt he's like oh crap we have an intruder in the house and then he notices that this guy's eyes are like flaming orange he's just feeling waves of anger and heat coming off of this guy his wife screams and throws the book she had on her bed nightstand at him and it goes just right through him and into the 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 hallway and he's waking from a sleep this this guy this thing is right there as it turns and starts to charge to towards them at the bed it it disappears into this black smoke weird thing and dissipates just, just disappears and as he's holding his wife and she's sobbing and he's you know really upset that he says yeah hit in the face with this smell of of scotch whiskey and smoke just right into his face he you know gathers his wife they go get the baby and they they leave go back to the mother house it wasn't till later he he goes over with some help to get all their stuff in the middle of the day as he's leaving there's there's several apartments there he ran into somebody and they're like yeah that happens a lot there people don't stay in that apartment they leave it's there's something really bad in there so when they left it uh, it didn't follow them luckily he <laughs> the funny thing is uh he took the his his wife still wanted the baby to have that sleepy time ernie so he did surgery and ripped the everything out of <laughs> out of the sleepy time ernie so it couldn't make any noise and after he did that then it finally you know never made noise again but um what what's funny is when he was telling me that i had pictures of the end of the movie poltergeist when they go to the hotel and the dad pushes the tv out on yes. the under the front porch to get you know he's like we're not doing the tv thing but um yeah that was really it was really kind of a you know a, a twist on the really ghost story somebody being there but uh, again with that ernie doll what hit home to me about it when he told me this and i told him this as well I had a very similar experience with my oldest. We bought that toy for him and it would go off all the time. And I took the batteries out and would wake up to the sound of it every once in a while and go and have to find it in the bottom of the toys in the closet. And when I got to it, it would shut off, but it wouldn't have the batteries in it. And I just threw the thing away. I was like, something, I, something must be using it or something. This isn't right. Whatever it is, I'm getting rid of it. And then after I interviewed this gentleman, uh, I was watching a show on Unsolved Mysteries, the new Unsolved Mysteries on, on Netflix. And a woman had a very similar circumstance where she was living in an apartment and there was the ghost of a murdered woman in there trying to get her attention. And it was using that doll. So I don't know if it's something about that doll or it's electronics or whatever, but it I'm not the only one and he's not the only one that's had an experience with that creepy doll. <laughs> oh yeah. Wow. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't realize cause I haven't watched all of those yet uh, on Netflix, the unsolved mystery. So that was even yeah. still also the sleepy time Ernie. So yeah, there must be something about that doll that makes it an easier vessel for things to use. Yeah, that it must be. Cause like I said, he had that experience. I had my own experience with it. And I about, you know, I was watching that. I like to put that on and watch because, you know, who doesn't like those? They have creepy ones on there every once in a while. And and her, the, the woman and her son had moved into this apartment and they didn't know that the previous tenant had been murdered. And her son's sleepy time Ernie started talking without the, without the, the batteries. And I was kind of in shock when I saw that because not only had I, you know, gotten that story, but I had had my own experience with it. So, yeah, that's that's a whole lot of nope for me. You you go and you're like, ah, oh, rip the batteries out, solve this problem. Oh, wait, got another problem because there's no batteries in it. And honestly, 
it's kind of one of those situations where, you know, you wake up, oh gosh, there's a man in the doorway. That is a problem. And is it, you know, is it a relief then when the book goes through what you thought was an intruder that you may have to, to have a battle with for your life or something like this, or then, you know, now it's another problem because, well, the book went through the guy that I thought was a real guy, right? Right, exactly. So it's a whole different kind of scary at that point. So, mm, yeah, that was a, that yes. was a whole lot of nope. So yeah, watch out for your uh, sleepy time Ernie dolls, guys. <laughs> and if hey, if you have one that has ever acted like that, get in touch with me so I can pass it on to John. Or of course, at the end of this, I will be asking John what the best way to get a or the best way to get a hold of him would be. And please do that because I'm sure that we would both love to hear more stories about Sleepy Time Ernie. Okay, last but not least, we're going to West Virginia and this is titled Booger, but people are going to assume that we're going to be talking about Bigfoot and we're actually not in this case. Exactly. It's an it's another name for um, an entity or something down there. And I, I looked it up because when when she said, you know, Booger, I I thought first, a Bigfoot too, but because I know that's another name they use for around there, but um, yeah, it's something a little bit different. So uh, Annette contacted me. She lives in Chicago now, but when she was younger growing up in actually the sixties, she lived in a really poor part of West Virginia and in the, you know, the mountainous West Virginia part um, of the Appalachians, Appalachians growing up there. She, you know, she talked a lot about running around without your shoes and, you know, doing what you had to do to make a living. And she didn't know at the time that her dad had really bad PTSD from his experience in the military. And he medicated with, with alcohol, which a lot of people did back then. And so because of that, he had a hard time holding down a job. He was kind of like a, a maintenance guy that would do odd jobs and stuff. So they didn't have a lot of money, but uh, they remember she remembered growing up happy and everything, but uh, she talked about uh, they had some land where they kept you know some their their farm and their vegetable garden, and then down at the end there were some apple trees, and the apple trees were right next to uh, the next land over, and there was a really old hermit guy that lived down there, and so they would share stuff with him, and her they she only knew him by the name Apple. They called him Apple because he was in the back uh, woods making apple jack, and that's kind of how he had made his living, which is a, a moonshine out of apples and and different things. But um, she was talking about when she was younger, her dad they they'd had a a, a freeze early or later in the year, and it killed a lot of the apples and a lot of the the food. So there wasn't a, there wasn't a ton of fruit at the time. Apple was down there, you know, taking apples from the tree and her dad and him had a, a really a disagreement on how many apples he sh they should share off the tree. And in the past had never been a problem because there was enough. Uh, Apple kind of cursed, you know, cussed out the dad and gave him a curse and left. And her dad was really upset. But they all, you know, they went home, they had dinner, went to bed. At the time she was 11. She shared a room with one of her brothers that was eight years old. In the middle of the night, it started with knocking on the door. Somebody was knocking at the door. And she got up and checked the door. There was nobody there at the door. She shut the door, went, but tried to go back to bed. And the knocking just got louder and louder, more disruptive. And she was scared to death. She climbed into bed with her, her brother. They were kind of huddled in there. After the noises and everything went on for a while, her dad came upstairs and got them. And they went down. Basically, the family huddled in the master in the her parents' bedroom in the bed, and for the entire night they were just te terrorized by something knocking on the walls, knocking on the door. Um, the door would come flying open. They would see this this phantom figure running through the house, and it just went back and forth between running past the door and doing things to them and knocking all over the house. And they it, it was just horrifying the whole night being terrorized. The next morning, her dad and mom had a conversation that she was not privy to, but he went and got the last of the apples in the house and walked out down towards Apple's place, his the, the, the little hermit's place. And he came back a while later with kind of a shiner and, a, you know, a scratch and and no apples. He, he'd given him the apples and 
she tried to talk to her dad about it. And obviously mom and dad didn't want to talk about it. The kids were trying to find out, you know, what, what are we going to do about this? And her dad's like, it's taken care of. Don't worry about it. And it did, did it went away and didn't come back later. She remembers being down in the garden with her dad working apple coming out and kind of teasing them about the booger that he'd sent at them. He's like, I guess you're not going to have any more trouble with those boogers. And, and she's like, she's like, what are you talking about? And her dad, you know, got mad at him and told him to leave and he just laughed it off and left. But later on, you know, she talked to me about, you know, finding out that, you know, some people uh, have the ability down there and you're, you're aware of this. I know from all your research too, that the Appalachians and Western Virginia and all of that, there's some almost black magic kind of thing that goes on. People who live in the woods and do things, they're able to, they say they can control and send evil spirits to people who have, who have done, done them wrong. And that's their way to get back to them and back at them and, and get things right. And so that's kind of what had happened. They called it a, they called it a booger, but she said that she was after that night, she was definitely a believer. And even to today, she understands she's like, he, he had the ability to send that to terrorize us. And it did. So it's very freaky. Yeah, that one was super creepy because you're kind of going, well, you can't even, you can't even battle against that. It, it's much just like the Faye situation. Then you just have to go and be contrite and say, I'm really sorry. Uh, I don't want any more trouble here. Yeah, exactly. And again, it's one of those things too, where a lot of folklore around different areas have very similar things like that, where people can, you know, curse you or, or do something like that to to try and make things right or however they see it. Um, I know that also it's very similar through some of this stuff in New Orleans with the the voodoo and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's definitely creepy that the idea that he could send that, you know, to their house somehow and, and terrorize them was really scary. <laughs> yeah. And then he just laughs it off. Like, uh, oh, guess you won't have any more problem with that because uh, your dad came over and he finally was uh, it, in supplication going i'm all, all is well here you go apple wouldn't you love to be able to talk to apple re- respectively obviously of course very very tread carefully much like robert the doll but i it'd just be so interesting to hear hey apple do you think that this was passed down to you through genealogy did you teach yourself to do these things or do you think it's a little of both right. you know it'd be so cool to talk right. to him yeah it would be to find out you know if he learned how to do that from, you know, his family or whatever. And I, the more I learn about the Appalachian mountains and, and the folklore and all of the stories there, the more I, I love it. It's, it's on my list of places I definitely want to go visit. I, I say that and my wife is like, well, I'm not going with you. And I'm like, sure you are. We're going to have fun. You know what they only, I love West Virginia. been there several times with Seth and the gang. The only thing is, if you get car sick, or even if you don't really get car sick, I used to when I was a kid really bad. I don't really now, unless we go to West Virginia. If you go to the hills and the hollers, and you're driving around, and you're especially, of course, sitting in the back seat, after a while, you begin to get a little green in the face in West Virginia. That's what I understand. It's very windy, and yeah. it's, it's you lose track of where you are. And I, where I live is, it's funny, uh, Annie and I, talk about it all the time i'm in utah everything's on a grid which is easy to find things and um i go anywhere else in the united states and i am easily lost because of that (laughs) so so john of course let's let everybody know uh how to reach you if they want to share their encounter and of course where to find all of your books Yes. So you can find all of my books on Amazon. They're available on softback or Kindle. Just if you look up Stranger Bridgeland book series, they're all right there. My latest one is Stranger World. You can look that up on on there as well. I have my website, which is strangerbridgeland.com. That's got all the information about me as well. A couple things, you know, I have some speaking engagements coming up. I will be in the first of the first part, first week of October, I'm going to be speaking at Utah State's Brigham City. They they have a lecture series. They invited me to come, and so I'll be talking about the paranormal and how it connects us to history and 
um, some fun stories about that as well. There's a couple other places I'll be speaking. You can find that on, like I like I said, on my website. And then if anybody's interested, uh, Annie and I do just a little podcast once a week. It's not nearly as cool as Into the Fray, but we just get on and talk about what's going on and some of the strange stuff. And that's just Stranger Bridgerland podcast. I hope it's like, okay, I throw that out. But Of course. Uh, yeah, you find out everything about the, what's going on. We talk about, you know, where we'll be and, and what we're go- talking about and just hitting some of the fun things about the paranormal on there as well. So. So probably uh, the strangerbridgeland.com, best way to contact you then? That's the best way to contact me. You have to go through there and find my, my emails on there. And there's a form too, if you want to contact me. And and like I said, I'm always collecting stories and always love talking to people. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. So might I say, I'm super excited, especially for the next book, Stranger Utah. So I can't wait to have you back on. Thank you so much for joining me once again. Oh, thanks for having me on. It's always so much fun. And I really, Annie and I just really appreciate you. And we appreciate you, all the work you do with Into the Fray and, and all your shows that you do. It's it's just fun to keep up with you and, and, and see you everywhere. And we just, we, we just love you. You know, Annie and I just love you. So you're always welcome here in Utah. So. Well, same goes to you guys. We, we've had quite the, the interesting history, and we are definitely good friends. And guys, please reach out to John if you are interested, because not everybody wants to go on a podcast. Maybe they want their story in a book and your encounters in a book. So reach out to John, please. That is, again, StrangerBridgerland.com and all of his books on Amazon. Thank you so much, John. Thank you.